Welcome. This online seminar is a collaboration between the NORAD funded NORHEAD program, the Saccade project, the DICU funded NORPART Excel Smart project, with its two partner institutions, Jimma University and St. Paul Hospital Millennium Medical College in Ethiopia, and the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo. Today, we will highlight the collaborative research, research education efforts, and experiences between Norwegian and Ethiopian partners. The Saccade project is drawing to its close, and we are especially focusing on this project, in addition to new and ongoing collaborative initiative. If time had permitted, we would have like to include all the exciting projects stemming from these successful partner collaborations. However, you will get a selection. Before we begin, I would like to quickly underscore some housekeepings uh, for this event. When you registered, you agreed to the session being recorded so that we can make it available to those not able to join live and later accessible on the website of Jimma University, St. Paul's and Center for Global Health here in Oslo. All participant microphones and videos will remain inactive throughout the event. This uh, webinar will include a series of presentations followed by Q&A sessions where you will have the opportunity to interact by posing questions to the speakers. We encourage participants to do so, and this can be done by using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can either do this under your name or anonymously. So let the seminar begin. And I am delighted to introduce to you Signe Marie Breivik, Senior Advisor, Section for Research, Innovation and Higher Education at NORAD. Please sing the Maria. Good morning to all of you. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I'm addressing you today. This Ethiopia Seminar 2020 is an important event as you are now moving towards the conclusion of the NORHEAD Project Sakaid. Some of you know the NORHEAD program, the Norwegian program for development of higher education and research for development quite well, while others are not so familiar with the program. Therefore, I will give you a short background and a summary of the program. Education, including higher education, is one of the highest priority areas within Norwegian development policy. We strongly believe that investment in higher education contribute to the development of intellectual resources, a competent workforce, visionary leaders, gender equality and human rights. It also contributes to evidence-based policies and decisions that enhance sustainable economic, social and environmental development. Previous Norwegian support to higher education and research through various programs, like the NUFU and the NUMA programs and the quota scheme, included support to individuals and institutions on master's and PhD level. They were based on joint teaching, curricula development, research and student exchange between the Global South and Norway. However, most of the degrees were taken in Norway. Following evaluation of uh, these previous programs, the NORHEAD program was launched in 2012. The purpose of the program is to strengthen capacity in higher education institutions in low and middle income countries to contribute to a more and better qualified workforce, increase knowledge, evidence based policy and decision making and enhance gender equality. The outcome level is intended to educate more and better qualified graduates and to produce more and better research conducted by the country's own researchers. We believe that this will also contribute to decolonizing of the knowledge produced and the education programs taught. The NORHEAD-1 program, which uh, was running from 2013 and will end in uh, the end of 2020, has a holistic and flexible approach, fostering institutional capacity for higher education and research in the Global South. 
It has a long-term perspective. It connects education and research. It is demand-driven by the needs of the partners in the South, and the projects must show relevance to institutional and national plans and priorities. It engages regional collaboration, requires in institutional commitment and involvement, and is based on mutual South-North partnership. Further, it includes cross-cutting issues like gender equality, climate and environment, human rights and anti-corruption. Typical intervention areas are development of in-country or regional master education programs, PhD studies and postdoc fellowships for academic staff, joint research projects, institutional and system strengthening, systems for knowledge management, information and dissemination of results, and scientific equipment and small-scale infrastructure. Development of innovative teaching and tools using technology are encouraged. Several projects have developed e-learning systems and, uh, infra and um, infrastructure online programs as well as massive open online courses. The latter can be utilized to reach the most marginalized students and contribute to the aim of leaving no one behind. This has also become very relevant during the last year of the global COVID-19 pandemic. The program is not a regular scholarship program. It is focusing on supporting faculties at the partner institutions, in addition to providing scholarships to a certain share of each cohort for students from marginalized groups, which could include female students, uh, students from rural population, ethnic groups, or disabled students. Today, the NUHED program includes 50 projects under six sub-programs, most of them in Sub-Saharan Africa, with an investment of about 1 billion Norwegian kroner. 13 Norwegian higher education institutions and 60 higher education institutions in the South are involved. In addition, the sister program, ENPE, which is focusing on capacity development within energy and petroleum, has a portfolio of 10 projects. This program is managed by the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, but will be included in the NORED 2 program that you will hear more about later today. The health sub program involves 11 projects, where 10 are in Sub-Saharan Africa, covering thematic areas within public health, including nutrition, reproductive health, entomology and epidemiology, health professionals training, like various specializations within surgery, nurse, midwifery programs, pediatric training and anatomy, as well as health informatics, zoonotic disease management, AMR and occupational health and safety. The Norwegian government has called the Norwegian program, the NORHED program, a central pillar in the development assistance for higher education and capacity development. And for Norway, the NORHED program is our most important tool to engage in partnership on research and higher education with developing countries. Therefore, Nor Norway has decided to continue the NORHED program in a phase two from 2021 to 2026. The announcement of the funding will take place on 16th of December next week with an, ad uh, with an additional allocation of about 120 million US dollar. The Sakade project we focus on today is a very good example on how the investment in education and research capacity within the field of public health, true collaboration between Ethiopian and Norwegian institutions and with national authorities and institutions can contribute towards several of the sustainable development goals. I must say, what I have seen during my visits to your partner institutions, including hospital visits and out in the field, training workshops and conferences, and in academic presentations by your students, I am very impressed. I look forward to hearing more and learning more through the presentations today and I wish you a successful seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Signe Maria. We really appreciated uh, your <clears throat> introduction to the NORHEAD program. And uh, I am uh, sure that uh, we will get more discussions uh, related to this as we move on uh, today. So then I would like to call upon uh, Hilde Elin Håland Kremer, 
She is the head of the section for global cooperation at DICU. And uh, that's where we have the funding from NORPOT. So please, uh, Hilde Eilin. Yes, uh, thank you. And, um, and uh, thank you very much for inviting us to this uh, seminar. Uh, DICU is an agency, it's a Norwegian agency for international cooperation and quality enhancement in higher education, and we are placed under the Ministry of Education and Research. Um, we are very uh, happy to be here to celebrate a job well done uh, as the activities of the NORHAD project comes to an end, and the NORPART project continues the good work through student and staff exchange and academic partnership. Uh, the world is quite a different place today than just a year ago, and it has been a challenging time for international collaboration and capacity building in education. However, I think the situation also makes it clear that international cooperation is more important now than ever before. We must ensure that students and future graduates are provided with the skills that they need so that they can help build a better future for us all. Now more than ever, it is important to invest in students and educational institutions in the Global South. Both NORAD uh, and DICU can play an important role here through the management of the NORHEAD and the NORPART programs. And as your involvement shows, these two programs can work well together. As I understand it, uh, the MOOC in Scientific Re uh, Writing and Health Science, which I look forward to learning more about in a few minutes, is a result of clever project management and the ability to see opportunities to develop innovative approaches to teaching and international collaboration. I know that you have had support from both your university and NORHAD, but we are also proud to know that NORPART has played a part in making the MOOC a reality. The overall aim of NORPART is to enhance the quality and internationalization of higher education in both Norway and the partner countries through academic cooperation and mutual student mobility based on common academic interest and strategic priorities of the institutions. It is a goal of the program to contribute to increased mobility between Norwegian institutions and institutions in the global south, and this goes both ways. The program is funded by both the Ministry of Education and Research and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and thus it responds to Norway's uh, higher education policy as well as development policy. Today, there are 46 NORPART projects in 24 different countries as a result of two calls in 2016 and 2018. Most of the projects are based in Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Uganda, and 14 Norwegian higher education institutions are currently involved. The next call for new projects will be announced at the end of February 2021 with a deadline towards the end of May. So you can just start working on new applications and we look forward to receiving many excellent applications. The Norwegian government has ambitious goals for international mobility uh, in the future and we are happy that NORPART and NORHAD projects will continue to contribute to this goal uh, as well as give students unique and life-changing experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilde. We really appreciated your presentation on uh, uh, NORPOT. <clears throat> and also, uh, truly, the next presenter will show how we learned from the Saccade, the NORAD-funded project, and made took it to another level, thanks to the DICA fund. So please, uh, Professor Anne Moen, Department of Nursing Institute of Health and Society. Uh, 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 the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's a real pleasure for me to share uh, some insights and some experiences in a very short period of time uh, from the scientific writing and MOOC development uh, that uh, I was uh, fortunate, lucky, and uh, uh, asked to, to, uh, to contribute to. So, uh, I wanted to start here. We had uh, quite some experiences from scientific writing workshops, and you can see some pictures from the field in Ethiopia, where we held uh, scientific writing workshops in uh, order where, which was uh, in-depth seminars, face to face, uh, to focus on the research process and key sections of a PhD proposal or a small project. 
we have reached uh, more than 200 people in this uh, effort, uh, and it has uh, also helped us to develop some of the resources. And this gave us a head start in terms of material structure and engagement strategies when we went to uh, take some of this material and the learnings to uh, and the capacity exchange to the new level of uh, a MOOC, how to write the PhD proposal which uh, was a uh, delivery from the Excel Smart uh, project that came with additional funding to do so. Uh, as you may know, a MOOC is a massive open online course and it is meant to reach out and it's meant to uh, build capacity uh, to a wider audience than what you can reach in a face-to-face -face or in a more physical meeting section. Uh, setting. So uh, what we did with this, specifically with this MOOC, was that we took the structure that we had, structure and content that we had developed and tested and gained experiences from in the scientific writing one workshops, which was a major activity in the Saccade project, also presented and alluded to by Signe Maria. And we took that uh, and transferred it to a MOOC environment through the Excel Smart uh, project, which was uh, uh, also mentioned by Hilde Erlin. <clears throat> so basically what we did was that we took uh, the topics of the day, uh, how we had structured the scientific writing, and we converted that to weeks in the MOOC setting. Because with the MOOC, you have a little bit more time, you're working on your own. Uh, but we still wanted to keep the structure. So basically what we did was that when we, in the MOOC for one week, you worked with the research statement, objective and some questions, which is a major uh, task and a major part of also the scientific writing workshops in Saccade. We have a week where we work with the literature, critical appraisal of uh, sources and research ethics. We have uh, also, uh, a week where we focus on design methods, instrument sample and setting, and then uh, project organization supervisors and teams. So this is how we converted the four and a half day intense face-to-face -face seminar uh, into a MOOC with new subjects for four consecutive weeks. And we also build it in a way that as a final assignment, taking your weekly assignment, putting them together, we were able to uh, uh, bring the students or show the students that these bits and pieces that they have done every week would give them the first draft of a small research pro um, protocol or a uh, PhD proposal. Uh, and again, this is a collaboration. You see the logos of the collaborating partners. I wanted to give you a little of a snapshot from uh, the MOOC. Here you can see a, a picture from a video lecture. They're also transcribed uh, because we wanted to be bandwidth friendly so that it should be uh, accessible in uh, across the globe and not be uh, So it's a plain uh, MOOC with good content uh, lectures from Norway and from our collaborating partners in the south from Jima University uh, mainly and that is also an example of how we tried to do this in a capacity exchange manner. The second half of the slide is also some of the interaction that goes on during the MOOC session where I have served as a lead educator, monitored some of the discussions and contributed. Uh, so this partnership model has helped us uh, a lot in realizing the MOOC. Uh, also, it's kind of fun to look at where are the participants from. <clears throat> this is from the first run where you can see the blue uh, areas on the map shows where the participants are from. And in this run, the participants declared that they came from 158 countries. So you can see that from this important collaboration between University of Oslo, University of Jima University and St. Paul Millennium College, we could reach out to much more than the two countries that started. You can also to the right in the picture, see where the, uh, in this slide, see where the active learners came from. 
And again, you can see that they are all over uh, the world. We're, this, this MOOC is built on Future Learn, which is a platform that's uh, supported out of UK. So that's probably the reason why the UK country is in such a dark color. But I think it is interesting and important to also see how this attracted participants from uh, the two countries, the, from the north and from the south. Uh, you have given me very little time, but uh, I wanted also to share a little bit of the highlights and some of the numbers. So uh, we have run this MOOC three times now. Uh, we have had more than 5,000 that has signed up. Uh, we know that it's used. It's, uh, they have looked for more than one step, uh, which is better than FutureLearn. We know that more than half of the participants have been what is, is defined as active learners. So they have marked as completed more than one step. That's a little bit lower than future learn average. We know that there are also uh, a lot of uh, social learners. And we know that uh, compared, but we also know, and this is something we need to work on, that compared to future learn, as such and MOOCs as such, this course is probably a little bit more demanding than what we have, uh, uh, what other MOOCs have, uh, uh, have shown. Having said that, this MOOC is also in the more advanced corners of what MOOCs are about. So it is realistic, uh, the findings are realistic and we are quite happy with them. Uh, so I think the important take home message here is that we took the, we took the uh, material that we had prepared in this and tested in the Saccade project, we converted it to the MOOC, it's available on FutureLearn and it's available today if you would like to sign up due to uh, how FutureLearn is also bringing out learning opportunities during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, what should I say? Yeah, uh, it's available. I would like to thank for the commitment. I would like to thank for funding. And with my last slides, I would like also to acknowledge the important people and institutions that has contributed to allowing us to develop this MOOC. And that's uh, colleagues in the South and in the North. And we also took our uh, a photographer and video recorder with us to to Ethiopia to uh, uh, to uh, record some of the uh, lectures and that allowed us to also demonstrate that we wanted to do capacity exchange and of course uh, I would like to thank uh, Diku and uh, Norad for the funding and on that note I will conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, really uh, exciting uh, to talk about this and that 5,000 people have used it. And uh, for those that are uh, seeking to be more adverse and skilled in writing um, brief, short press, uh, research pro protocols, please join it. This is beneficial even for seasoned researchers. So thank you very much. To you, Anna, I will then move to the next one, which is uh, 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 Associate Professor um, uh, Misra uh, Abdulhani from the Department of Population and Family Health at Jima University. Uh, please, uh, Misra, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll be presenting on the topic uh, effects of breastfeeding education and support on early initiation, exclusive breastfeeding and growth in rural Ethiopia a cluster randomized control trial. Globally, 2.5 million neonatal deaths have occurred in the year 2017, and majority of these deaths have occurred in low and middle income countries, mainly from preventable causes. And according to the Lancet 2016 report, if scaled up at universal level, breastfeeding can improve survival of children by preventing an estimated 823,000 annual deaths of under five children. Despite such established benefits of breastfeeding, glo globally only 42% of newborns were put to breast within one hour after birth, and only 42% of uh, less than six months old children were exclusively breastfed. When we see the breastfeeding practices situation in Ethiopia, 
73% of infants were put to breast within one hour after birth, and 58, 58% of uh, and less than six months of less than six months old children were exclusively breastfed. When we see the figure from Ethiopia, it seems that it's better when compared to the global level. However, still it is below the national target of 80% by 2020. Systematic reviews of breastfeeding uh, promotions, uh, pro promotion interventions have shown that uh, peer support interventions can improve uh, early initiation of breastfeeding and exclusive breastfeeding, uh, particularly when these interventions are provided uh, both during prenatal and postnatal period, as well as when the intervention includes more than five visits. However, in Ethiopia, there are no published randomized controlled community-based trial of such interventions. Therefore, in, in order to fill this gap, we designed a cluster randomized controlled trial to evaluate the effect, the effect of uh, breastfeeding education and support on early initiation, exclusive breastfeeding, and infant growth, which was a cluster randomized controlled trial. So the trial was uh, conducted in Manna district, which is uh, one of the 17 uh, districts found in Jumazon. Uh, the, the district had, has 78 uh, sub-districts. So from this, we, we selected 36 sub-districts, which are not uh, adjacent to each other and in which uh, similar interventions were not running. So we then uh, random, uh, randomly assigned these 36 sub-districts into either an intervention or control group. And then we selected all pregnant women who were in their second or third trimester and also living in the selected cluster uh, between May and September uh, 2017. From the intervention clusters, we selected one women development army leaders uh, from each intervention cluster. So uh, totally, we selected 18 uh, WDA, WDA leaders and then trained them for five days using WHO's, UNICEF's, and USAID's uh, breastfeeding counseling manual. The breastfeeding education and support in the inter intervention included two prenatal visits and eight postnatal home visits. And additional visits were also provided uh, according to the need of the mothers. Primary outcomes of the, the trial included early initiation, exclusive breastfeeding, and infant growth, whereas the secondary outcomes uh, were knowledge about breastfeeding, attitude towards breastfeeding, and infant or child morbidity. Data were collected at baseline during enrollment, at months one after delivery, and at months six uh, postpartum. So we found that the intervention has increased early initiation of breastfeeding by 25%. Uh, uh, exclusive breastfeeding by 15% and attitude, uh, the attitude score by 0.85 standard deviation. So we conclude that in Ethiopia training WDA leaders who are already in the country's health system can substantially improve early initiation, exclusive breastfeeding and attitude towards breastfeeding. However, the feasibility of integrating this intervention into the existing primary healthcare system of the country needs further investigation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Misra, who will submit this next spring as part of her PhD uh, for the University of Oslo. This is a sandwich uh, model, uh, but it's not the only publications that uh, Misra has done over the last uh, year, five years since she now has been approved as an associate uh, professor. So kudos to you, uh, Misra. Thank you. Uh, please uh, post questions for Mistra and for Professor Anne uh, in uh, the Q&A. And we will then move on to the next uh, presenter, who is Professor Seleke McConnell, the School of Medical Laboratory Science Health Director for Research and Innovation at Jimma University. So please, uh, Professor Seleke. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for such nice eventually prepared and uh, I would like a few words about uh, the progress of PhD program development in Ethiopia and the pros and the cons in the next five to six minutes. Next please. So the overall goal of uh, PhD development is uh, 
Uh, the core component is advancement of new knowledge through original research where uh, to produce competent uh, professionals and to increase professionals to mitigate brain drain and to meet demand of its population. For that reason, uh, the public universities in Ethiopia increased from two in 2002 and over 45 today. And the following is not only the number of universities which increase in Ethiopia, but also expanded the program undergraduate, MSc, and PhD. Just as a very quick example, if you compare 2015 and 2006, we have no any PhD program in social science and humanities, for instance, and today we have 40. And if you go down in medicine and medical science, there was no PhD program at all, and today we have over 15. So there is a change in quantity and type, but also there are problems, which I will tell you in the next slide, few points is what are the challenges. Next, please. So, as I said, our university is increasing. The government is putting a lot of efforts, and yet there are challenges on ground with respect to PhDs. Among the many, the major challenges include uh, in those universities coming up, the staffs are extremely young with inadequate exposure to research themselves, uh, inadequate exposure to international collaborations, which ultimately affects the quality of student research output is not optimal as we demand. And besides that, the infrastructures, research budget allocated for this are far beyond uh, the expectation, uh, which also end up with a legacy stay of our PhD students in a university that is also connected to attrition rate, fear of uh, completion of the PhD, economic burden, and all over uh, they fear there was uh, a mismatch with uh, market or job after their graduation. And one of the major ground is we are still uh, stick to the traditional way of teaching curriculum, especially the American-based curriculum. So, our students spend more than half, 50% of their time taking really huge courses without focusing on the specific uh, needs that geared to, toward the specific PhDs. And then this is also aggravated by lack of really uh, well-organized program evaluation and monitoring. And above all, uh, some of the PhDs are based what we call legacy dependent. And some professors or departments, they just open a PhD program without looking left and right, pros and cons to maintain that the legacy, they are the owner. So overall, the consequence is really multifactorial. There is a political interference. There is lack of industry research linkage. There is lack of international collaboration as we are expecting. The university infrastructure, as I said, are far, which all together impact this negatively, what we call negative consequences, like we are uh, acknowledging now low quality of training, in insufficient resource or proper use of resources, PhD fatigue among the candidate and institutional incompetence and very limited low international and national uh, recognitions. Next, please. So I would like to say a few words about the second program and the progress we have made with our partners and the ultimate goal, what we have learned is the capacity building in research and the research education, which has been really backed by providing PhD education. Uh, so many students from GMA and St. Paul Millennium College are taking and some of them have already, uh, we started collecting the fruits not only the formal PhD education, there are a number of other short-term trainings that have been given through this program from our uh, professors from uh, Norway, uh, which have been said in detail earlier, and also create a strong strategic program for monitoring and evaluation, 
One best example is through Excel Smart, uh, the development of MOOC, which, which is already said by the previous uh, speaker. And overall, uh, we came up with the support and the concept of one PhD system, where I have to say in the next slide, few points about the progresses. Next slide, please. So the major achievement I can share uh, very proudly with the support of SACED and NORAD is that we have gone through process development together with St. Paul Millennium Medical College and Jima University took the first uh, step in assessing the need what our university or PhD program runs have uh, values, shortcomings and problems. We have analyzed that uh, assessment and we have organized last year uh, around October 30, if I'm not mistaken, a national conference at Addis Ababa with uh, Norwegian M uh, Embassy, NORAD, SACED, and all other people who are here right now. And that result has been really well taken. We have invited more than 40 university presidents and vice presidents. We have really said the pros and the cons of haphazardly and old fashioned curriculum based. Uh, and then finally, the way forward, we reach on consensus, at least there has to be an institutional guideline in place so that we can really pull all our resources together instead of haphazardly and uh, honored by individuals. So with this, I feel confident that uh, the support of SACED and NORAD is tremendous and uh, we have put different uh, office coordinating PhD students that can really guide the PhD programs and then increase the collaborations. And based on that, the St. Paul Millennium College also has initiated this one PhD system with a new entry applicants. So we are on the right track. Sooner or later, these uh, two institutions can really extend to the rest of the universities. Why? Because there are a golden opportunities that the government is committed uh, openly acknowledge that there is low quality of training. So there is a high demand for 110 million people. We have less than 300 professors. So there is high demand and national policy for capacity building, which are now uh, very good uh, visionary where university starts to change their legislation. And the government has taken the initiation to separate the universities into research universities and other categories. So we are in the right track and we will support this national uh, capacity building where international collaborations will come in and play with win-win uh, uh, program. And then we will go on producing more joint program uh, in the countries, co-advisorship until our junior uh, staff will get more experience and also toward training toward really specific goal and job market. With this uh, very short brief, we are on the right track. I would like to really acknowledge all people in one way or another taking uh, this initiative, supporting Jima University and the rest of Ethiopia. And that we are here also learning more and more every time. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, if I got a chance to present about PhD progress in a few years, or I will say more. Thank you very much. It's, that's what I can share. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Professor Seleke. Thank you very much. As uh, the listeners can understand, we have an intergenerational institutional mentoring and going on as well. So uh, University of Oslo is mentoring Jima and the St. Paul Millennium Medical College with the anticipation that these institutions will mentor their peer institutions and other newer uh, institutions in Ethiopia. Many of you ask if it's an opportunity for you at a different university in Ethiopia to join us. 
but it is not. But since now St. Paul has announced its first one PhD program, as there are several new PhD programs also at Jimma, there is increasing opportunities. And Jimma has, congratulations to Jimma, just been uh, designated as a research university in Ethiopia. So this is great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we have then a few questions. And the first question I will is going to uh, Professor Anne. Would it be possible to build in methods assess how initiatives like the MOOC influence the numbers of proposals submitted, or maybe numbers that actually go into a project implementation? Professor Anne, could you talk about that, please? Yeah, I would. I, I, I uh, thank you very much for this important question. Uh, and the answer is twofold. The MOOC itself uh, and MOOCs by their nature, their, their sweet spot or their, uh, their uh, uh, it's their sweet spot or their uh, the difficulty with MOOCs is on the assessment side. So we offer, we make the offering people participate. The premise is that we have engaged, active, self-directed learners that follow the program. But, and then <clears throat> when you have marked as completed a sufficient number of uh, steps that is in the MOOC, you will get a certificate of attendance from the platform. But we as hosting institutions do not <clears throat> issue any certificates. Uh, furthermore, uh, we don't know, because we don't keep track of that, how many have used the MOOC to, as a stepstone to, to uh, uh, actually start on the PhD proposal. Uh, so uh, we know how many complete most of the steps. Uh, and you can see that it follows the usual pattern of a MOOC. Uh, but I, I would have very much like to answer said yes this is what we know but the fact that we chose the MOOC to make sure that we could stimulate to capacity exchange capacity building and bring the resources to a larger audience comes with some uh, also side effects or downsides so we made the material available uh, we follow and monitor the progress and support the learners. But when it comes to really taking the last mile is in the, uh, is in, uh, how, and the last mile on how that influence uh, numbers of uh, uh, successful PhD applicants, uh, I cannot tell you because that is beyond what we can do with the MOOC. Thank you very That's much. Thank you. Then I have a, a question for uh, Professor Selike. So, uh, but first I would like to say that the sandwich model for the Saccade project, uh, of course, anybody who has not completed their PhD with the University of Oslo is still University of Oslo's responsibility and uh, everything is in place so that they will have their advisors until uh, the, the time allotted by the university uh, no longer uh, provides advisors, but that will still be another year or two. So those of you that are in the program do not get frustrated. But there is a question for you, Professor Selike. Saccade has been implemented for about seven years in Ethiopia. And what are the main impacts of Saccade on elevating challenges related to quality of PhD training so is there any capacity building that has been done as stated in the name, Saccade? Please, Professor Selike, would you like to answer? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Janet. Uh, to be honest, yes, there is a capacity building created within the program. If I just start uh, from the uh, minor, not only PhD, there are a number of academic staff who, have, who has been trained in grant writing, scientific writing, uh, proposal writing, so on and so forth. So it has stimulated a number of uh, young researchers and, and to go into uh, other uh, individual or institutional development. So uh, there is no question. Uh, probably the question should go, do we have as much as it was intended? Uh, of course, there are other 
problems, uh, an institutional problem, the country problem, but with as a piece of project, what is contained in the proposal, I agree. And as I said, this is the first program that Jimma University has as an international collaboration, even to include uh, the gender balance and the most neglected profession from nursing students is where we have a lot of capacity building and probably Jimma University is the first university to have more female PhD holders and from nursing professions. So I'm proudly say there is a capacity building. Thank you very much. There are people who answer if how they can join uh, the PhD at the, uh, the, uh, the, the St. Paul Millennium Medical College. And that is to contact the local uh, coordinator and the, the, the leader now for the one PhD program. And that is Dr. Samrawit, the head of the uh, Department of Public Health uh, at uh, the School of uh, the St. Paul Millennium Medical College. Uh, so uh, then, uh, then there is another uh, question to you, Professor Selike. Is there an opportunity for alumni of graduate study, but working outside of academic institutions to be considered for PhD programs at your, uh, at your university? Yes, indeed. Uh, there are, uh, we are trying to bring what we have experienced from Belgium uh, or Flanders University, where we have alumni who have been working in different regional or government organizations, as long as they are competent enough. And then, as I said, because of uh, the new uh, guideline development, where our university is categorized as a research institute, there is an open gate that we have to really explore opportunities where standard and industry linkage and different stakeholders who are supposed to really a leader, educator and mentor. Not only we are training for academic uh, to work only in academic universities. Well, originally, yes, much of our product goes to uh, universities and they just become a mentor or instructors. But honestly, there is a shift of emphasis and there is a, on, an opportunity and that's where we are working. And of course, we have already had few applicants outside universities uh, as alumni. So that's the area where we have to work. And definitely the answer is yes. Thank you very much, Professor Selike. Then there is another question. And that is the whole thing about what is called the one PhD system. And I think it's important to then firstly address that at the University of Oslo, every faculty has one PhD program. So at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Oslo, we have one PhD program. We have 1300 PhD students enrolled and many of them are in clinical, some in basic science and some in public health or other related fields for health sciences and medicine. But there is only one program and that program is coordinated by the Dean's office so that there is no single department, single research group that actually is the ones that quality assures the program. And uh, the question is thus to you, um, uh, Professor Selike, that there is a confusion among the staff and leaders about the one PhD system because of its concept, mission and vision that is different from the more, what should I say, perhaps the American PhD program where you have one PhD program in each discipline, one PhD program in nutrition, one PhD program in epidemiology and so on. Is there anything that can be done to solve this prob problem in Ethiopia? What's your take on that, Professor Selke? Uh, again, thank you very much. Yeah, you have perfectly explained there is a confusion and it was really uh, uh, very much difficult for us uh, to really 
introduced. So the problem I see from different angles is not only the disadvantage and the ad advantage, but it is also the attitude of uh, some of our staffs. Uh, in some side, I can understand their fear because it is a kind of uh, sustainability or ownership and they don't see the wider advantage. As I said several times, the, the university is expanding, the number of students are increasing, but equally there is no parallel increment in resource, in human capacity. So instead, if people are confused and clear their confusion that one PhD doesn't mean one degree, so within a system or with one PhD, we would have been much more beneficiaries because we can pull the resources. One instructor, let's say from Norway can come and teach for one week, the whole one program. So if we go to that stage, definitely we will improve. But the problem, uh, as you say, each department wants to own and it is a kind of identity crisis, I will say it. But that identity, now there are few departments, few individuals are coming and still we have to work hard what it means. Some people without really knowing and balancing the pros and the cons of what one PhD system, they just blindly categorize, okay, you want to make it, uh, I have to specialize in nutrition, but you want to make it a PhD in health science. I, I, I say, no, it's not that. You, can, you have still a room to say within one PhD, you can give the names to the nutrition, but that doesn't mean uh, within a nutrition or health science, people can study different side of the coin. And yet there are certain green lights. It's not straightforward. Uh, as I said, uh, we have had and a kind of survey almost certain universities and many of the really uh, in individuals involved in the problem of these old curriculum based and hazardly problems are thought that okay you are taking the lead of the government rather it would have come from the government top down now but you may university and a few individuals with of course the thank you yeah, thank so you. we are on the right way, but the challenge is still there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for your questions. Please continue asking questions. We will then move on in our program and we will move to another PhD student, which is uh, Demelash uh, Evnetu from uh, St. Paul Millennium Medical College and Center for Medical Ethics at the University of Oslo. Please, uh, Demolage, the floor is yours. This is a project I'm uh, dealing with, Circular and Religious Approach to Abortion in Ethiopia, a comparative ethical analysis. This is the whole of the overall project. So under this, there are various articles that are coming up. So abortion is a, a contentious issue globally. Uh, so the International uh, 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 Conference on Population and the Development that has been held in Cairo in 1994 is uh, stressed to give uh, uh, abortion services when there is a lawful. And the MAPTO protocol as well also asserts that uh, having access to safe abortion is the human right of uh, every woman. So after uh, the MAPTO protocol in 2003, then African leaders have uh, tried to liberalize their law. So the Ethiopian abortion law has been liberalized in 2005. So now abortion is allowed when the fetus uh, is uh, malformed, if the woman has uh, mental or uh, healthcare uh, uh, incapacities, or if she is uh, raped or uh, incest. So, uh, on, and again, if she is underage, she can have the access to uh, abortion. So when I come to the first paper of my uh, article, it says still a moral dilemma, how Ethiopian professionals providing abortion come to terms with conflicting norms and demands. This is the first paper that is published in uh, BMC Medical Ethics. So uh, under this, uh, we have investigated with a qualitative uh, research method, 
using the systematic text condensation of healthy uh, 30 healthcare professionals with uh, a structured interview guide and uh, in depth interview. So we have found that uh, these uh, uh, providers have uh, moral allegiances that are reconciled with their work. So uh, with the, the main finding that we found is uh, that the moral status of the fetus with count counts not to providing abortion, but the interest and the needs of uh, a woman count for providing the service. So in overall findings, since we investigated from the private healthcare sectors and the public healthcare sectors, the private healthcare sector providers have less moral uh, anguish than compared to the public health sector one. So we conclude that these studies highlight the difficulties and the reconciling tensions between religious convictions and the moral norms and values and professional duties. So such insight may inform guidelines and healthcare takes education. This is the findings from a number one article. The second article goes, professionals experience means conscientious objection to abortion in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. It is an interview study. The same methods was used. The method includes um, uh, from chows to teams and from teams to cords and from cords to condensation and from condensation to analytical writing. So here, uh, there are uh, healthcare providers who have a dilemma concerning their jobs, even though uh, while complaining, they are doing uh, their jobs, but still they are wondering whether they to have changing their uh, positions and the ATC, there is their concerns. But in Ethiopia, what is specifically known is that conscientious objection in Ethiopia is not allowed by the law or by the regulation. It, Ethiopia is the first African country to forbid conscientious objection of providers. Providers can't, can't uh, deny giving healthcare professionals uh, abortion services. This is uh, the finding. But despite the regulations, uh, there is conscientious objection occurred in healthcare providers, especially from public health uh, uh, sectors. Most of them are not doing, but they are uh, stating that uh, even though they are not doing it, they refer it for, to uh, uh, the one who does the service. So it's not a problem to have that with that. So they, they, they stress that professionals have also their own uh, uh, individual rights. So their individual rights has to be uh, protected and uh, uh, regulated. So we have concluded that more societal and professional discussions of ethics and the regulations of conscientious objection and a clearer link between legal regulations and ethical guidance for professionals are uh, called for, for this paper. And the next one is navigating abortion dilemmas, attitudes and practices among Ethiopian healthcare professionals. Still, even though the law is now a semi-liberal uh, law, even though it's not totally liberalized, the, uh, the providers have still have their uh, dilemmas because uh, women uh, uh, presenting themselves with different reasons. So the one of the reasons that women present for abortion is um, economic reasons, for instance. Since economic reasons are not allowed by the law, so professionals have a, a dilemma to give the services when the criteria are, criteria are not met within the regulation of uh, the law. So the, the providers interpret the abortion uh, law criteria within themselves and they put in dilemma and they found this is a difficult situation uh, with, uh, to be able to make a conclusion with that. But uh, if you take, for instance, uh, aborting for fetal anomalies, so for aborting for fetal anomalies, only the woman has the right to decide on that. So uh, professionals advise and tell the, prof the, uh, prof the woman to take her own decision, for instance, in case of Down syndrome, whether to carry it to term or whether to abort the uh, child. The last one is Ethiopian religious faith leaders from the Orthodox Sawado and Islam views on the ethics of abortion, hard cases, and the 2005 abortion law. 
since in Ethiopia, 98% of the population counts themselves as religious. So almost 60, 63% are Christians, which are uh, Orthodox Christians and uh, Protestants, and uh, 30, around 34% are uh, Muslims. So it is a religious country, so that's why there is a religious opposition for the practice of abortion in Ethiopia. So it is uh, a matter of investigating uh, what the religious faith leaders have on uh, the ethics of abortion, hard cases, and the 2005 abortion law. In this case, uh, the, in general terms, both the uh, uh, Orthodox Christian faith leaders and the Islam ulamas consider or abortion, condemn abortion in a general sense. But the Orthodox Christians uh, are more conservative towards this, uh, the practice of abortion. Uh, they held different types of insolment. They Some of them say the insolment starts from conception, some say from 40 days post-conception, and others are around the first trimester of conception. So the main argument is that after consumption, after insolment, abortion is never allowed by uh, religious uh, uh, perspective. So in Islam, if we come, Islam stress the 120 days of insolment. So Islam normally tolerates the practice of abortion if it is below the insolment period, within the 120 period uh, of post-conception. If there is a case, is, is a, such as hard cases that are allowed by the law, it is possible to have uh, access for uh, abortion. So. That is all what I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Demilash. So here we have one unique uh, thesis project, uh, Demilash ethics, uh, practice, policy in Ethiopia related to abortion, and MISRA, which is a community intervention and both are then in the one PhD program at the University of Oslo. So thank you very much. We will please post questions for Demolosh in the Q&A section. We will move on to the uh, next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Uh, Gudina uh, so, uh, Tuchu, uh, Associate Professor at the Department of Environmental Health Sciences and Technology He's also the director for community service and engagement at Jimma University. Please, Dr. Gudina, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm going to speak on uh, research ethic capacity development in Ethiopia. Uh, then, in the following uh, slides, I'm going to focus on uh, what why do we need uh, ethics uh, research ethics, uh, and also why what 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 what. Uh, uh, stakeholders are involved, what issue, uh, the ethical issues do we need to address, uh, what challenges we have uh, in Ethiopia or in Sub-Saharan Africa and what are the possible uh, recommendations. So I'm going to try to focus on that and talk on that uh, point. So first let me uh, talk about uh, what, why do we need uh, research ethics. Uh, the purpose of uh, research ethics is just um, uh, to, to, to protect the safety, right, and the well being of research participants and also to promote uh, ethically sound research. Uh, so, in order to do this, we have to address the ethical issues from starting the research up to publication. So, in this case, um, when we conduct research during data collection, analysis, report, writing, and also publication, we have to consider those ethical issues. So the ethical issues should be uh, considered at each step because we, do, we, we have to uh, protect the safety of uh, and the right of the well being and the, uh, of the participants uh, while promoting. So in this case, it's a kind of balancing doing the right and uh, uh, wrong. So in this case, we have to consider all the ethical issues. So we have to abide to the moral rules and the course of conduct is professionally. So in this case, by doing this, we can uh, promote or uh, uh, ensure the safety and the right of those people involved in the research. So uh, in order to address this, what ethical issues and the core values should do we need to take into account? The first one is 
this such participant safety should be ensured because those involved or invited for the research should be the right safety should be secured or ensured. Gender issues should be uh, considered. Process of gaining informed consent, especially when we invite people or study participants, what kind, how are we going to invite them? How are we, are we going to just talk to with them? How are we going to convince them and also invite for invite to the, to the study? The other one ethical issue is vulnerability of the population. How do we address the issue related to vulnerability, especially with underage uh, people at social and economical disadvantage? Uh, so those, those things should be taken into account, account when we conduct a research. The other one ethical issue is the how we distribute or weigh the balance and the benefits, especially in, uh, the relation, in relation to uh, some uh, uh, clinical trials. So there should be some uh, safety issues. Uh, so in this case, we have to weigh the risks and the benefits. So if the risks outweigh the balance or, or, or the benefit, so that study should not be conducted. In this case, uh, we have to have sufficient understanding how we are going to weigh the risks and the benefits in order to run the, the, the study. The other one is autonomy, incentive, coercion. How are we going to invite people? How are, are we going to in, uh, involve them? Those things should be also considered. The other one is the privacy or confidentiality or personal identity or personal information of those study participants or the community should be secured. We don't have to use personal issue of or personal uh, information of study participants. So we have to have certain ways by which we address those personal information, identity or privacy of those people involved in the study. The other one is monitoring safety or protection, especially when we conduct, especially on some trial studies. We have to monitor, especially those people involved in the regulation should follow how we can address those things. So in order to do this, uh, those is H and uh, all the stakeholders have ethical value or responsibility, accountability for what they do, um, there should be uh, guiding principles or research integrity and the values. What are the social values? What are the research values? What kind of values are we going to have? How are we going to address uh, 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 cultural values? Those, those things should be uh, uh, taken into account. So in order to address this, there should be engagement of stakeholders. What are the stakeholders for any research? In this case, the first one is participant or communities, those invited for the studies or the community from which the study participant involved as the stakeholders or should take, should be engaged from the beginning when we conduct the study up to the end. So in this case, we have to consider all this, uh, with the, this, this study participant and the community should have sufficient knowledge or awareness about the study which is going to be undertaken. The researchers should be knowledgeable how they, uh, the, the, the research they are going to do, the benefits, and uh, um, but also how they manage their studies. Research ethics review committee also have certain obligation and accountability how to address when they allow the study or when they monitor and uh, 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 so they have, and as the regulatory agencies, funding or sponsoring the agencies also have certain accountability or responsibility to uh, pro protect the uh, safety right of the study participants. So what are the challenges we have in Ethiopia or in Sub-Saharan Africa to address these issues? So the first one is, there is a growing research collaboration in Africa because there are international interests for uh, research to conduct in, in Africa or in Ethiopia. 
So this may involve data transferring where personal uh, information also involved in the transferring the data. And also there are uh, some issues related to addressing ethical issues with varying rules of, I mean, ethical rules of regulation between different countries. The other one is growing research interest in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially now due to uh, uh, increasing of uh, uh, educational opportunities when postgraduate and also uh, due to collaboration of uh, uh, the such increasing such collaboration, there's also increasing interest in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Ethiopia. So, but we don't have much knowledge about how to address ethical issues. This is one of the main challenges. Uh, lack of working framework between different levels, especially between research between researchers, between community and between local uh, uh, regulation or national regulation, there's, uh, there's no much connection or working framework for to make uh, monitoring evaluation on uh, ongoing research projects. The other one is poverty and the poor resource availability is also another challenge which can affect also the distribution of the benefits or which also leads to exploitation, exploitation of research participants. Low community engagement is another challenge that we have, um, with which may lead to low level of understanding uh, about what is going on, or by the community as well as by uh, those involved. Increasing corruption, which may lead also ethical breach or exploitation of those study participants or certain communities, uh, which can affect also the uh, soundness of certain researchers. You have Low level of awareness, lack of focus on ethical issues is also another issue. So in this case, the second project has done, has done a lot of uh, uh, ethical uh, research training, in, in, especially with some clinicians from uh, Jimma University and from uh, um, St. Paul, but that was not enough. Uh, so we forward as, uh, as a home tech message or as, as a way forward uh, biotics training integration in, in the curriculum is very important. Uh, Short-term training for postgraduate researchers, research is also um, already prepared by the second project and also in, part, in preparation to be given in the near future. This is already uh, in the process of uh, in, in the form of online or distance mod module. Uh, the other one is developing standardized working framework and uh, it's very important. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Gudina. And uh, we just have to say a kudos to uh, uh, Professor Jan Helge Solbach, uh, who together with his team from Norway and the team from Jimma and from St. Paul have taught more than 150 uh, academic staff in various aspects, both of research ethics and on how to work uh, in uh, research ethics committees. And we are very excited, excited because um, uh, they have agreed to make this electronically and digitally. So during 2021, uh, this will be available to anybody. So we will share it through the network. And uh, thank you to Dr. Gudina, who is then one of the partners in this plus in another large uh, research projects that the team, uh, the Ethiopian team and uh, the University of Oslo Center for Ethics have uh, uh, gotten. So this is great. As you see, um, Ethiopia has to create its own evidence. So uh, Mr. Demelarch's project is about gathering information so that we know what's the evidence, what's, what's going on in Ethiopia. And uh, uh, Dr. Gudina talked to you about the training and the training needed. So here is a question for Demelash. What do you think is the reason why healthcare providers in private institutions seem to have a more liberal attitude to abortion compared to healthcare providers working in public hospitals? Uh, thank you. 
uh, because uh, uh, the regulation uh, that are uh, the prevalent in uh, private sector and uh, public institution is something uh, different because uh, when they are employed in uh, private sectors, they already convinced that they are going to be abide by the rules and the regulations of the institute. So it is their own active choice to do so. So they experience less moral dilemma compared to uh, public uh, hospitals. But in public hospitals, most, most of the practitioners didn't practice abortion, but some of them, some liberal practitioners undergo or take receive their uh, collagus uh, part and they do it uh, themselves. So it is their own choice to do that and the regulation of the institutions. Great, thank you. There is also an encouragement to you to check out the publications by Karen Marie Mulan uh, and collaborators that has looked at abortion laws and practice in Tanzania, Zambia and Ethiopia. So I'm just giving you this information and also for those others listening who is interested thank in you. this. I would say it, yeah. And, and then there is a question to you, uh, uh, Dr. Gudina, and that is the whole concept of gender issue in research ethics. Will you talk a little about that? Uh, yes. Uh, now it is that uh, there is um, issue of considering gender because in this case um, we are not giving much attention in the previous years especially for uh, with respect to gender. Nowadays, there are growing interest in, in developing countries, especially in Ethiopia, uh, especially on this. The second project has a lot, much on this case, especially with gender and the leadership to make them to increase their capacity and leadership as well as the research. So a lot has been done. Now there are a lot of uh, increasing interest is also in, uh, in higher education, especially in Yuma, now to go for further education, to be involved in the research uh, by getting uh, motivated by those training. So they are more and more interested to go to uh, uh, also. Uh, now we are even, we are also going to uh, uh, establish also a, a, a gender-based research center in Yuma University, which uh, will be maybe if, if we are successful in the near future with in circuit too. So that is also another uh, really uh, big step that we give my university is taking with through this circuit project. Thank you very much. I am very pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Haile Mikhail Desalegen, Associate Professor of medicine and director for ECHO program at the gastroenterology department for uh, St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College. So please, uh, Haile, uh, the, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Janice. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, I am, thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'll try to present in brief with this, uh, the coming seven minutes about the Hepatitis B cohort project, which we have been doing in Ethiopia with the support at the University of Oslo. So just to share the, uh, it's mainly on the Hepatitis B, just to share the national seroprevalence, zero no, uh, as such national service in Hepatitis B, but this is one data from the EPHI, which was short also at the Ministry of Health showing the hepatitis B prevalence at this uh, uh, to be around 9.4%. Different meta-analyses have shown 6 and 7.4%. And from this study, we can see the some areas which are actually having a hot spot. So there were no treatment um, uh, programs in the country and there are no well-organized treatment uh, systems and the hepatitis B treatment, whether it is feasible in low income setting was not known before. So our main aim was to show actually to have a feasibility of a long-term treatment program in a resource limited setting. Uh, thereby we will have a simplified algorithm for the management of hepatitis B 
and through this uh, to uh, decentralize the care and to probably cover a wider scale uh, that could be applicable to other low and mid middle income countries. So we started this in February 2015. So we're able uh, to recruit patients from um, uh, patients with, with from different aspects. Actually, patients referred to St. Paul Hospital, uh, positive with hepatitis B virus, and then we have uh, standardized questionnaire, clinical examination, we have lab testers. These lab tests were not initially available in the country, especially the uh, viral load and um, RC and also the fibro scan. And it was probably the first when we have it uh, in Eastern Africa country. So this transient elastography, what does it do is, it measures uh, liver fibrosis. It is almost equivalent to a liver biopsy. And it is on also vital uh, to determine which patients are actually in need of treatment. So I'm not going to detail, but we have this baseline assessment and we follow patients every three months. And also we have some tests which are expensive actually that help to assess patients' improvement or not. And also whether the patients are improving not only on the viral load or on the viral level, but also in the fibrosis, whether the disease has progress or they develop a cirrhosis or a cancer or decompensation. And we also do surveillance for HCC. As hepatitis B and HIV are almost similar in the lifelong treatment, we also assess the adherence, uh, their compliance to the treatment, their retention to care. And we also give through this time uh, how can they support their families in prevention of the infection? Uh, to, to to a larger scale. And with this, we are able to recruit one, more than around 1,300 patients recruited, and this had been considered one of the largest cohort in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it helps us to show countries what is the treatment eligibility. So if they screen many patients, how many patients will, will be eligible for treatment? And uh, the other important aspect that we have tried to show is like to challenge uh, guidelines, especially the WHO that recommend non-invasive markers that had been actually studied for others. Uh, they were trying to add the extrapolate it to African setup. We have shown that such kind of non-invasive markers are not feasible to African setup. So Africans should develop their own um, setups. One of them is like this APRI score which we have studied and shown that the sensitivity is very, very low, and this should not be used to our setup. And we are trying to uh, formulate other stakeholders involved so that we, we need to have our own non busy markers or a different cutoff value to assess uh, a simplified treatment protocol. And uh, with this end, uh, we came to a criteria for treatment of chronic hepatitis B patients. Uh, we named it as a St. Paul criteria. It had been published. And we, we used uh, cirrhosis as a main marker. You can see how many patients has been eligible based on this criteria. And we use a fibro scan. So the one of the major change probably is a fibro scan. The other guidelines use liver biopsy. So we used a liver fibro scan as an assessment and we used ALT more than two times upper limit of normal and viral load. And as uh, Africans in different studies have shown that hepatocellular cancer occurs at younger age and it has associated with this uh, smart prognosis, we added HCC and high viral load as also a marker or as a criteria for treatment. And this has been published and has been presented in the different international uh, conferences. Uh, so with this, we have, we have tried to assess the feasibility of a treatment program. The one-year data has been published at the BMC Medicine. We have shown the safety, adherence to therapy uh, with retention to care, uh, the virological suppression with treatment, uh, fibrosis improvement. You can see in the uh, graphs, change in the liver fibrosis based on the kilopascals. You can see virological response to therapy, which was important. We also show decentralization in care which can be used as similar to the HIV model in which the physicians can be involved in the uh, decision to treatment. And also if there are any complications, they can be consulted, but the other care can be decentralized to, you know, state up, it could be health officers and also 
like in the ART clinic, in the follow up can be done by trained uh, nurses. And with the three year results, so we have still 291 starter on treatment, as I've tried to show in the feasibility uh, of the treatment, like if you recruit main patients, and the feasibility could reach up to 25%. And one uh, big problem that we have seen is you can see 13.4 patients are actually died after three. This is from those who started treatment because there is no free treatment set up in the country. Many of the patients who are sent are actually having decompensation. So within the first, uh, especially in the first three years, we have uh, such kind of patients who have died because they come late and Actually, we have uh, many patients at this stage decompensated. So those who survived after this are we're having uh, very, very good response to treatment. So we have shown loss to follow up and uh, four patients had HCC because these patients are also having advanced cirrhosis at the baseline. With the treatment, there was no serious adverse effects, no resistance uh, from uh, of the tenofovir treatment. There was excellent adherence comparable to uh, other countries, and uh, viral suppression was 86.1% after one year of treatment. And these are the references. Actually, these references are our publications in different uh, high-impact journals and uh, presentations at, uh, of abstracts at different uh, international conferences. So I would like to say to Sintak, thank you. And the ETH NOHEP is ETO Norwegian Hepatitis Project. We have the plan to scale it up to a further scale. And I hope with the support to get, we can increase and involve, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Heile. And uh, I'm excited that the, the, not, uh, the cost extension for the Saccade project uh, gave us the opportunity to invite you as a senior researcher to Norway to expand your research collaboration and to plan future grants and publications with your team here. So we are very excited about that. And uh, if we should be so fortunate to get Sekade 2 uh, next week, uh, I am sure we will hear more of you in our fora the next uh, coming five years. So thank you very much. We will thank have you. some thank questions a little yeah. later. Now we will move to the next speaker, uh, who is um, uh, Dr. Oskar Johannesson. He is the deputy director uh, of uh, the Center for Global Health um, at the University of Oslo. And he is also a consultant in infectious disease at Sieve Hospital in Vestfold. So please, uh, 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 Oskar, and uh, the, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. You can see my screen, I hope. Yes, I can. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I have a various affiliations, uh, and as you said, I'm recently appointed at the Center for Global Health, but uh, what I will present today is something we did in Ethiopia within the uh, field of clinical research capacity building, uh, and it was uh, from this uh, center, the Center for Imported and Tropical Diseases at uh, Ullevål Hospital, that uh, was est established by the Norwegian Minister of Health some 20 years ago. and. Uh, I'm just mentioning this because this uh, center and people working there have been working with Ethiopia and in Ethiopia for many years. First with the leprosy in the 60s and 70s, and then with schistosomiasis in the 80s, which has educated three Ethiopian uh, PhDs. And now over the past decade, um, we have been mainly involved in Ethiopia and South Africa. And in Ethiopia, it has been mainly schistosomiasis, hepatitis B and other liver diseases. And in South Africa, it has been schisto and HIV. And the research has been funded by various um, uh, partners, including Bill Gates. So I will now give um, a few examples of what we have done uh, um, in clinical research in Ethiopia. So my main involvement of the past five years has been with St. Paul Hospital in Addis Ababa. And as Heine Mikkel, uh, just presented, the Hepatitis B treatment project has been the flagship. This has been the most important uh, achievement, and uh, we have invested heavily in that. 
And the starting point was, uh, was just a simple question. How can hepatitis B be treated in a low income country? And over the past five years, um, we have shown how that can be done. And two Ethiopian PhDs have completed their uh, thesis on this topic uh, in June 2020. Um, our work has also influenced national hepatitis B guidelines in Ethiopia and probably uh, in other countries in Africa. And our data sparked uh, a revision of the WHO hepatitis B guidelines. Um, because there is a total lack of data in this field from Africa. And uh, recently, we initiated a network uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa of uh, everyone involved in hepatitis B work. So that has been the flagship of, a, of, a, of a clinical research. And then the snowball starts to roll. So the NUCSTOP study is um, a study on stopping hepatitis B treatment with uh, 11 participating centers in Scandinavia and Africa. So uh, St. Paul is the only, only center outside Scandinavia taking part in this study. And more recently, we have also uh, started two other studies on uh, simplified uh, diagnostic testing. One on H. pylori, which is peptic ulcer disease with an Ethiopian PhD fellow. And another one on uh, ALT or liver injury uh, testing, which uh, we run a pilot in 2020. And um, the snowball continued to roll a bit further east. So um, once we were in Ethiopia, uh, we were challenged with, um, with the, the presence of an unexplained liver disease in Eastern Ethiopia. And we were challenged to try to figure out what this was and uh, quite Quickly, when you come to East Ethiopia, you, know, you notice that everyone is chewing cut. So we had this as a hypo hypothesis that this was the cause of it. And we set up a case control study in uh, Harar, where we included 150 patients with liver disease and 300 healthy controls. And then we compared cut exposure in the two groups. And without going into details, um, the main finding is what you can see here in the red uh, square. Uh, with increasing cut exposure, uh, the odds of a liver disease increases. Uh, and this was um, the conclusion is that cut is uh, liver toxic. And this is the first time that it is ever shown. And uh, it was a Norwegian PhD fellow who did this work, the one at uh, the picture here, Dr. Stian Olien. And uh, this is to say that, of course, we need to educate uh, Ethiopian PhD fellows uh, when we are working in Ethiopia, but it's not a waste to educate Norwegians as well in the global health issues. And Stian is now going back to Ethiopia and becoming an Ethiopian. He is now employed by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and will be based in Harar for the coming, well, lifetime. This work we have done ha has resulted in a number of uh, nice publications, especially this one in the middle sparked a lively discussion in the WHO. Uh, but more importantly, we have uh, been building institutional capacity with our various partner institutions, including Addis Ababa University and St. Paul Hospital and uh, hospitals in Harar and Harama University. But equally important, um, we have been building up people and institutions are nothing without its people. And uh, we need to build up champions of uh, uh, the country, local champions who can continue to take this on once um, uh, once the project is over. And we have been doing this. This is Dr. Harald Mikael, and this is uh, Dr. Hanna, uh, who have been uh, both uh, involved in uh, the Hepatitis B project and uh, completed their thesis earlier this year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for sharing the history of uh, what the Oslo University Hospital has been doing. And also welcome on board as the deputy director for the Center of Global Health. And if we would be so lucky next week to get Sakai to Oskar Johannesson is going to be the lead coordinator for the clinical research uh, capacity, the advancement uh, continuing at the St. Paul's uh, and also branching out to building relationships because we have a lot of renal transplant uh, physicians also interested in this. And we uh, are excited about the opportunity to also include Ari. 
so that we can build capacity on the laboratory side. And the, so uh, this uh, that was some of my, uh, what should I say, hidden agenda for inviting both of you, And uh, but it's very exciting. So Hayala Michael, another uh, uh, partner uh, is Øystein Hartrø Johansen, who is asking you, uh, and I just have to say hi, Øystein, long time since I saw you in uh, Ethiopia, I hope you and the family as well, but the question is, would you be able to share something about your plans for future Ethiopian scale-up of Hep B treatment programs? So, uh, for the plan of scale-up program with this uh, Oslo University Hospital support, we have we are planning to scale up into other regions of the country. So we have uh, we have started the process of scaling up this treatment program even to a simplified uh, model to other parts of the country. So, and now we are involved, so stakeholders should be involved. So we are involving the Ministry of Health, uh, part of the technical working group. So government support should be there to scale up to a wider scale. But as a researcher, we are, we are trying to scale it up to other regions uh, in the country so that we'll have more individuals involved in the treatment. Thank you very much. There's also two other questions. Is there a need for, what is the need for creatinine test? And the other one is, what do you recommend if there is no viral load and slash or no LFT service available? Yeah. So the creatinine is important uh, as a drug that we are giving is tenofovir and tenofovir Initially, following up with the creatine is important. Fortunately, we uh, we have only one patient actually who developed uh, renal failure, and that needs treatment. All other patients didn't develop this side effect, uh, so it's important to follow them with creatine in, as uh, to monitor the side effects of therapy. Mm. The other patient it, it was on the treatment viral. eligibility criteria, so. Yeah. Patients has died uh, because we enrolled patients, there is no treatment program. So at that time, patients who have late or advanced disease. Can yeah. I think that because you and uh, doctor or even us, us. Early cirrhosis without decompensation. We have even shown that patients with decompensated cirrhosis and having standard of care had improved, but it's good to find them as early as possible. So it is a problem of uh, no treatment or lack of treatment availability to wider scale. So if you have uh, such treatment programs in a wide scale, you find patients early and they will not develop cancer or advanced disease. But even we have shown that giving treatment at those stages will improve their outcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Oskai, uh, there is one asking, would you briefly tell me the POCT for ALT and the H. pylori project? <laughs> well, the point of care test for ALT, that is uh, something that has been developed from uh, the Burnett Institute in Australia. It looks like a simple pregnancy test, like all these rapid tests. It uh, is very, it is a, a very neat uh, invention, but it needs validation. And uh, H. pylori is uh, is a rapid test which you get the result. Uh, it's like the commercial one uh, that you use in the gastro labs in our part of the world, except it costs uh, one percent of the commercial one. Thank you very much. And to both of you, it's exemplary work on how to build quality-based capacity building uh, the, the clinical work that the, the two of you have done together with all your PhDs and the other people that you mentioned. And uh, we wish you both success uh, going forward in advancing clinical research. As I mentioned earlier, it is imperative that Ethiopia build its own knowledge base. And your study is actually an example of why that is important to do on the ground in a sub-Saharan African country. So thank you very much to both of you. Then we will move on to the next uh, speaker, uh, which is actually uh, Professor Kåre Magne Nilsen. 
He's head of the Department of Life Sciences and Health at the uh, Oslo Metropolitan University. And uh, Professor Kåre Magne is uh, heading up another NORPART, another DQ funded grant, and he will tell us what they are doing in Ethiopia. Please, Professor uh, Kåre Magne. Thank you for uh, inviting uh, also Oslo Met to take part in this uh, very impressive set of uh, presentations and activities that are now uh, going on with uh, various collaborators. So uh, our take on this is a North Park project we got funded in 2019 uh, from Oslo Metropolitan University, third largest one in Norway with a fairly big uh, health faculty. We have uh, previously been somewhat involved in activities in uh, Ethiopia, mainly through the collaborations with Oslo University Hospitals and uh, oncology nurses and radiation therapists. Uh, through the contact of Jeanette Magnus, we were then also introduced to, to various partners in, uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, uh, she was really a door opener for us. And we went both to Yima and to St. Paul and established uh, quite quickly uh, collaborative agreements with these two uh, institutions to sign memorandums of understanding with the two um, presidents and provosts of the two institutions. So, so that's the, the backbone and we started uh, in uh, well, early 2019 uh, based on a um, uh, granted Nordpark project, which uh, has the following title, as you can see on the screen. Uh, of course, NORPART is uh, very much uh, oriented towards uh, facilitating student mobility. Uh, unfortunately, now in the Corona time, uh, that has been uh, put somewhat on a hold. So uh, we haven't really been uh, advancing as far as we should on the student exchange uh, part. So the goals of the, the project were really threefold. Uh, um, one is the, let's say the partnerships in the allied health sciences. Uh, second one is to increase uh, collaboration through, through different uh, uh, educations. And the third one is also to have a focus on innovation, entrepreneurship and community-based training uh, in those three lines. So uh, for the first one, we had uh, established in collaboration with uh, St. Paul and it's Addis Ababa Burn Emergency and Trauma Hospital. And the idea there is to establish uh, a master program in paramedics, a master program that can then also serve to train teachers at, uh, at the bachelor level. Uh, we had a plan to uh, invite um, the student class uh, this fall to Norway, but that didn't really materialize. So now we are also looking at developing more digital uh, interfaces uh, to. Uh, at least facilitate some uh, some of that uh, collaboration. Um, this is of course with the paramedics education at the Oslo Met. At the my university, the the goal is to uh, exchange uh, students at the PhD level mainly in the biomedical laboratory sciences, so the more analytical side of it. And also a fantastic uh, future of the university, uh, Yima University is really the engagement in the community. So we want to learn some more about how to engage in social entrepreneurship and develop the innovation uh, orientation there and uh, in, uh, in the context of our master level students as well. Uh, the outcomes in a few years should be as uh, stated here. Uh, we have started and we hope to deliver on the promises uh, at some time point. So I'm also very happy to see both uh, Yudina and Seleke, who will be a part of um, that collaborative team uh, forward. So with that, I would like to thank you. And uh, again, a very impressive uh, meeting with so many activities going on. Thank you very thank you. much. And I also have to say good luck to you for uh, December 16th, you might get your NORHEAD 2 uh, award uh, funded. And that is together with the Oslo University Hospital and the emergency team there. And it would really catapult 
uh, your project and make it even larger and go to scale and become uh, like an emergency uh, central for the whole city of Addis Ababa. So, hey, we are crossing fingers that you have <laughs> success because that would be so exciting. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving of your uh, <clears throat> busy time schedule for us today. And then I am moving on to another very busy uh, professor, Marianne Yara, at the, the Norwegian uh, uh, Business uh, School of Business, uh, BI, here in Oslo. Uh, professor Marianne is uh, a professor of uh, supply chain management. And as you could see in one of Kåre Magne's pictures, uh, she was there. So please, uh, Marianne, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. I assume you can see my screen now? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Yeah, I feel quite a bit of an anomaly in this very distinguished company coming from a, a business school and even a private business school in Norway. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about partnerships, I think, and then also mention a few of the projects that we are working on. So I want to go back a little bit. And the start of this uh, whole work was actually when I partnered with uh, Jeanette in a dinner in Addis Ababa in the spring of 2017. A coincidental uh, dinner organized by, by, by my daughter, who was an intern at the Norwegian Embassy, and she found out that, okay, let me, let me link Jeanette and my, uh, my mother together. And we started to discuss. And uh, then when Jeanette heard I was working on logistics, she said, oh, you should start some projects with Ethiopia. So that was the starting point. And then, as also mentioned before, I was uh, allowed to join the big group with Oslo Met and uh, University of Oslo uh, in 2018. Um, and seeing, you know, the, the uh, sign off of the MOUs and so on. The whole idea with, for me on that trip was actually then to discuss um, the sustained project idea, which is one of the projects I just want to briefly mention here. And this is a project, and then I started to discuss with the business college in Jima University. And the idea with that project was really to work on supply chain management, entrepreneurship, and business development. Similarly, with, with Kori Magnus project, or, uh, funded by DICU, the focus of this project is student mobility uh, and collaboration. And the whole idea here is to work with Jimma and uh, Mzumba University in Tanzania to come up with ideas for, for sustainable entrepreneurship based on supply chain management thinking. So that was one of, I'll come back to it uh, briefly in a second. Then life moves on. So a little bit later, we started to develop a project on drug shortages and looking into the increasing crisis of shortage of drugs across the whole world, uh, which is, was, was then the background of the MIA project, which I'm going to say a few words about. So we started off uh, and got funding from Norwegian Research Council for a research project on drug shortage. One of the ideas with our project was to simulate a big epidemic and then look at what could be the interventions in the supply chains in order to avoid too much shortage. And then we were, as everybody else, <laughs> taken by reality uh, with, the, with the pandemic. So the MIA project originally started 28th of February. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the pandemic occurred and we applied for a bit more funding uh, for COVID in particular. And then we were so lucky that we could also then team up with St. Paul's and with Jima University and this time health in the Health Institute to look at causes and, uh, and in possible interventions when it comes to epidemics. 
So whereas sustain is much focused on teaching and mobility, uh, the MIA project and the MIA task force or the supply chain research group for COVID it's, is focusing on developing decision support tools to help key stakeholders making good decisions, evidence-based decisions to improve availability of medicines and health commodities. So that's kind of the background a little bit. And what I want to do now is to just give you a few glimpses of each of the projects in terms of what kind of activities we are actually doing. So when it comes to sustain, we of course also have been influenced by the, by the pandemic in terms of student mobility. But before uh, everything stopped in a way, we managed to have the exchange of students between all the three institutions. They all write their reflection logs in a way reflecting upon their, their stays when they have been at BI and vice versa. Um, so that's one big part of the project. The other big, big part of the project is to co-develop, co-revise different types of uh, courses and programs within supply chain management. And as you see, everything became dig digital because of the pandemic. So we are, have been working together with our partners on trying to come up with digital supervision concepts. We are doing sensitization workshops, again, you know, using Zoom. And we have so far focused a lot on uh, anti-corruption and also came the opportunity for me to develop a course in crisis management, preparedness and response uh, based on COVID-19, which I did the first time at BI uh, this summer. And then part of the project is also actually to develop teaching cases within each of the countries and which we can exchange to try, uh, try to teach students in the other countries about the, the different contexts. And that's started and it's on ongoing work. And then part of this project is also dissemination, both in terms of more popularized uh, papers, seminars like this and so on, but also uh, some focus on scientific papers. And we have a website, try to keep it updated and you might find some more information there. And the picture in the top here is a picture where we had our inaugural meeting uh, in April. Uh, uh, and this is a meeting between uh, Dr. Kenenesa de Bella in uh, Beko and myself uh, when we had our seminars there. So that was what I wanted to say about sustain. Uh, when it comes to MIA and, uh, and the COVID task force, obviously this, uh, so we started this project 1st of May this year. And we have been, you know, it's quite challenging to set up projects with together in these drug shortage projects. We are about 30 researchers in 12 different countries and we have had to set everything up digitally. And it's very hard when people don't know each other, you know, to have good discussions and deep discussions in Zoom meetings. I'm sure you have all experienced this, but it's coming together now. And again, I'm not going into details on findings or, or projects so far, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of the key activities we are doing. So one of the things we consider very important in this project as well is to have exchange of knowledge between the different partners participating. So we've had quite a few seminars because this project constitutes people with medical uh, competences and people with logistics competences. So you, in a way you could say, apart from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, uh, the European institutions are mostly lo logisticians, whereas Ethiopia with, with St. Paul's and Jimma really strengthened the medical competences within the project. So it's very multidisciplinary and we are learning, all of us. So, which is why also we have tried to have these workshops in order to exchange and learn from each other uh, some of the basics within the two different fields. Obviously, working for me now with crisis logistics and, and drug shortage, it has, it has been quite busy <laughs> during the past, uh, past months. I feel I've been living in a research laboratory. So, by chance, there have been a lot of opportunities to try to disseminate what we are trying to accomplish, which is more the popular papers that I list here. 
Uh, and this has to do with normal drug shortage, uh, but of course also with what's happening with logistics and how does it affect uh, drug supply chains now with the pandemic. And then we are now finally coming to uh, the end in terms of setting up different sub projects. And uh, those of, of uh, those which are going to occur in Ethiopia, we have one group in, in uh, St. Paul's, who's going to the study on routine uh, childhood immunization, focusing on vaccine and vaccine supplies. How was this before COVID and how has COVID changed uh, the challenges and the solutions? Then Jima University uh, has just finished developing, I think it's with the ethical committee as, as we speak, uh, where the focus will be on mapping supply chains for chronic disease medicines as well as paracetamol, because we have decided that we want to pick, a, you know, a simple drug for us logisticians, at, at least. Uh, and we are doing a, setting up now a cross country study in six European countries in and, and Ethiopia on paracetamol, trying to map the different supply chains, looking at what happened in terms of shortage before, during and hopefully post COVID. So those are the sub projects ongoing or in development right now. And then this is a very strong group in terms of uh, scientific papers and paper writing. So, so we are working a lot with different types of uh, scientific papers aiming at uh, logistics operations management journals, social, social science journals, public health, and hopefully also then medi more medical journals. And again, you will find more information about this, uh, these projects uh, on uh, our website. So, and obviously being project leader for the MIA project, I'm, I'm called Mama Mia. So that's my role these days. So that's what I wanted to say about what we're doing so far. And I really thank for the opportunity to talk a bit about what we are doing. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mariana. This is uh, absolutely great. And I'm so grateful also to uh, the uh, extension project for Stacade that permits us now to have eight Ethiopian colleagues from the two institutions in Oslo at the same time. And uh, I just want to share with you that uh, the all of them have had to be 10 days in quarantine. And uh, I, for me, it seems as if they have used it as an academic uh, <clears throat> time for diving into things they had, uh, publications and so on in their uh, drawers and that they've had protected time, perhaps for the first time in their careers. So. Thank you, Norad, for giving us this unique opportunity in the COVID that we could extend the stays with additional 10 days. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Marianne. And uh, uh, if we are lucky next week uh, to get Sakaid uh, to, uh, you and uh, your team at BI will be part of uh, 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 harnessing the uh, hospital management uh, program at uh, Jima, and you will establish a new hospital and supply management program at St. Paul. And if, if anybody believed it wasn't necessary, COVID has shown us that management and understanding of the whole concept of supply is extremely, and the management of supply is extremely, extremely important. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today. So then um, I have one question in the chat. Uh, that I haven't answered, and that is, uh, does any collaboration exist between Jima University and the University of Oslo in the field of health economics? And the reason why I haven't answered it is because the next speaker will uh, address some of it, uh, but uh, also other aspects of our part, uh, uh, of the concepts that we build our partnerships on. And that is Professor Taya Hagen, who is the chair of the board of the Center for Global Health, but he is also 
the head of the Institute of Health and Society at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Oslo. And he will also talk about other things that he has been doing. Uh, so please, uh, Professor Tarje Hagen, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. I will, uh, <clears throat> I will uh, talk without using slides um, because this is in a way the end, the last speech of the seminar. So I would like just to, to say a few words and, and, uh, and sum up. So my name is uh, Terry Hagen. I'm the head of the Institute of Health and Society, uh, the Institute at the UIO, where both the uh, SACADI and the Excel Smart Project has been uh, organized. I would say it's been a, in a, been a pleasure to, uh, to listen to the presentation this uh, afternoon. I think the gains from the programs that have been run are both impressive and encouraging. And although we should be um, careful with drawing conclusions from only one or two or, or two cases, it seems to me that to uh, identify a few core institutions for long-term strategic capacity uh, advancement uh, partnerships has, has uh, really paid off. I think this was suggested by one of our former deans uh, at the medical faculty. Uh, so he, he, his main uh, vision was to concentrate on a few uh, universities uh, in Africa and then create this long-term uh, partnership. So as hinted by Janet uh, or Janet, uh, this partnership has been cross-disciplinary. It has included uh, many different departments, both in Oslo and in Ethiopia. And personally, I've been teaching two courses at uh, GIMA. Uh, it's one course in statistical analysis of health data. And together with my colleague, uh, Professor Odvar Korbe, also a course in economic evaluation. This teaching has been both challenging and encouraging. For example, we have learned how to handle and to Im improvise as uh, the power uh, went away. And, and we have been stimulated by the great effort of the students that has been uh, forced to work both, uh, both night and day. But we are not stopping here. In the coming year, we will go on with developing our cooperation. And personally, I will mention two uh, events that will be important to me. First, uh, as part of our project, the current head of uh, Health Management and Policy Department at CIMA, uh, Shimeles Ululu, will arrive in Oslo in January uh, as a PhD student. Uh, Shimeles is part of the Nordpart Excel Smart project, so he will receive funding uh, here. And the second thing I will mention is that together with my colleague Olvar Korbe, we will go live in 2021 with digital, digital versions of the two courses that we have been teaching uh, in person in, in Ethiopia. Today, uh, we have learned a lot about um, how the PhD programs in Ethiopia are evolving. Uh, and I'm excited about the news that German University now is dis designated as a research uh, university of, of the country. I think this is really great news and an, an important step for further progress. When Janet asked me to say a few words at the end of this seminar, uh, I asked her back if she could give me a few talking points. Uh, and she gave me some suggestions and I've been, I've been elaborating a little bit uh, on these talking points now. 
but there was one thing I was really missing. Uh, she didn't mention that these two projects, the Secade project and Excel Smart project, and also more project has had a very engaging, engaged and hardworking project leader. I think Jeanette has been working with these projects from Oslo now for six or seven years. Uh, and before that, I know that she was also engaged in project uh, uh, with her former university in the, in the US, in, in Louisiana. So on behalf uh, of uh, both uh, our institute of the Institute of Health and Society, the Faculty of Medicine and, and the University of Oslo, I would like to thank you, Jeanette, for the effort and the engagement you have shown. We all uh, appreciate this uh, very much. So by these words, I will give the word back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very, I really appreciated that. But it takes a village to raise a child. And I just want to say that without everybody, uh, from the University of Oslo, it has at any given time been close to 25 faculty and staff that has been involved. And at Jimma and St. Paul, equal high numbers, knowing that we have uh, four hour courses, workshops and seminars at St. Paul and uh, 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 and uh, Jimma combined, we have had close to a thousand people. Uh, we had close to a thousand attendees. Some people have attended many of the different things, others have not. So that means, uh, and I really hope we can continue. Now. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to next week to see if we can continue because there is still a lot to do. And of course, I regard us as mentors because we have gone the way before. You know, if we look back 50 years on where University of Oslo and where Norway was, I was graduated from a school of uh, medicine up north that was established in the 70s. And I know it takes time. And I'm delighted that the University of Oslo has decided to use time and to actually focus on some. And uh, Professor Talia, what you forgot to mention is that some of the same things that you are doing in Ethiopia, you've also been doing in Myanmar with the My North uh, Norhead projects. And if they also get additional funding next week. It means we will be double dipping on you and Professor Corbus capacity and competencies in health economic evaluation. And it will be shared between those two countries uh, as we go along. One wants to know about the clinical laboratory capacity building uh, because that person is uh, related to the clinical laboratory and would be interested in knowing more about it. And I, I think you've gotten a new dean in the Faculty of uh, Health Sciences at Jima. Uh, would you address that? Uh, maybe Seleki will be the right person to inform the actual process, if I can ask yeah, Seleki. Yes, please, correct. Seleki. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, as, as Karen said uh, earlier, we have we have discussed last week uh, with Oslo Med and uh, uh, Dr. Shaul also. Yeah, it was originally started with uh, mainly focusing on medical laboratory science or uh, biomedical science, not specific. So still, uh, besides the COVID pandemic and uh, every interruption, we have had discussed uh, to look for potential from medical or biomedical sciences uh, for the next immediate uh, travel or exchange to Oslo Med, provided that we find a matching uh, supervisor from here, which we are working on it, and also selecting competitive uh, applicants from Jima University. So the guy who asked on the 
uh, chat is uh, yes, that is the reality and that is where we are working toward. Thank you very much. Then there was another comment and that is uh, that it is great that so many people have participated. However, Ethiopia need quality education. And that is then a challenge that all the staff at St. Paul's and Jimma has to do and uh, to advance quality in education. And I know there are initiatives uh, at uh, St. Paul's and also at Jimma. And I know, uh, Dr. Uh, Heile, uh, are you still here? Uh, no, I don't think so but they actually have plans of establishing a master's program in, uh, in medical education uh, and, or in health sciences education. At Jima, they do have such a master's program. So slowly and gradually, uh, it will become increased quality of the education. Uh, then I think uh, we have, uh, I will forward some of the questions uh, to that are unanswered to the individual that you addressed it to. But before that, at the tail end of our seminar, I since we have been looking back uh, during um, uh, these two hours, I, we are now looking forward and I'm delighted uh, that <clears throat> Assistant Director Solbjörg uh, Sjövajan uh, at the Section for Research, Innovation and Higher Education at NORAD is here to tell us a little about Saccade uh, or uh, about uh, NORHEAD 2 and what uh, we can anticipate uh, uh, will happen the next coming years with uh, the initiatives from NORAD. So please, uh, uh, Solbjörg. Solbjörg. Hello, uh, good afternoon. It's good to see all of you. I was asked to, uh, to say some words uh, at, the end, uh, at the end, and, uh, and here I am. Uh, I, um, I, uh, I've been working with the Nordhead program for um, about three years since I took over this position. And uh, I have to say it's been, uh, it's been quite a journey. Um, I've been working in development for quite a number of years. I think almost, almost my entire career now, I would say. Um, and um, but I think it when I when I learned about uh, the higher the, the, the higher education uh, and the, the research part of development, I have I really felt that. Um, that that gave a lot of meaning because uh, I believe that uh, uh, in order for uh, developing countries to develop, uh, I believe that uh, higher education research plays a major role and you play a major role in this. Uh, and I, I believe that that's, that's uh, one of the main solutions. And I also seen, actually, I've seen a recent, recent uh, research uh, from, I think it was the, the University of Oslo, together with uh, some partners in South Africa, that they just released some uh, some new um, uh, new numbers, and also um, on 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 the development of and the trends of higher education and research in 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 um, in uh, Africa, south of Sahara, and and of course they are still uh, a way ways to go, of course. Uh, I mean, lots have happened in the last few decades, uh, but, uh, um, and, but surely not enough. But one of the, one of the new um, numbers that I saw from that research, and I guess that was just citing other, other uh, sources, that was that now the World Bank has, um, before it was always this uh, competition between higher education and lower education, and what gives the best rate of return. And now uh, I've seen that uh, the World Bank has now come out and said that actually the rate of return when it comes to eradicating poverty, it's much, much higher in higher education than, than, uh, than actually earlier uh, thought. So I think uh, that's, um, that gives also hope that uh, for the future, uh, 
donors like you know that I represent uh, Nura, but also the international community will uh, will actually focus even more uh, funds uh, and resources towards uh, towards that because. Um, um, so I, I hope that that will be, uh, I hope we will see that. But anyway, um, I have met during my time as the assistant director in, in, in NURAD and, and the, the head of the research section, I have met quite a few of the, the projects in NURAD and I've also met uh, several of your um, the workers uh, and the participants in the Saccade project and I've learned about it. Um, as you know, and I'm going to say a little bit about Nordhead too, but but uh, let me just say that when it comes to the Nordhead one, which you are part of, um, it, it, we have used much of our experience from Nordhead one to develop and design Nordhead two, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the program document because I know you have also applied for a new uh, new round, um, but to develop the design of the new Nordhead program, we have actually used a lot of experience from uh, from um, Nordhead 1 and your uh, your project, the Saccade project, has been uh, important uh, for uh, to give input into that actually because uh, uh, and, and you have contributed constructively to the Nordhead 2, 2 development because uh, uh, especially I think what you have done on the gender side has been uh, very very important uh, and you've been in the forefront there with the among all the dual program. Um, I also believe that the one PhD is quite unique, actually, uh, and uh, and and that would be. Uh, I think that if you succeed to to roll that out, I think it would be really important in order to achieve um a much much stronger um uh, research milieu and and capacity in 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 ethiopia um and so i i think you have been in the forefront of quite a lot of things in your project so um you have also had a, a quite a lot of uh, uh, research published as well uh, so, um, so all in all, it's it's been quite a successful project. Of course, you have not succeeded in all all areas, but uh, uh, that's the context that we are working in. Uh, it's uh, it's always high risk; things happen, uh, and um, but I think all in all, we can say that uh, Saccade has been quite a successful project. And I thank you for inviting me uh, to the conference and, and to say a little bit about NURHEAD 2. I, I can't say too much, but what I can say is that uh, we are in the process of concluding the call for proposals. Uh, it was out in February. I think the deadline was uh, right before the summer. And we have been working all fall uh, to review all the applications. Um, it's been uh, thoroughly reviewed by uh, in, uh, IRCs, International Review Committees. Um, uh, also embassies in the various countries uh, have been part of this. The technical departments in Nura, then of course my department or my section as well uh, have been involved in this. I can, what I can reveal is that it's been quite hard competition this time. We, we received 199 applications. Uh, and uh, many very, very strong applications uh, with high quality this time. Uh, so it's actually been quite a tough task to conclude um, because of the good quality, but also, uh, and of course, I think the ma majority of emphasis has been on quality this time because of the, and, and the IRC's um, work has been emphasized quite a bit but at the same time Nura needs to have have we need to look at the whole portfolio to see if it has a good balance to to see if it covers all the sub areas in the thematics programs and so on so we have also had a lot to say in it but but mostly it's been the IRCs and the quality that has been the most weight uh, when we now conclude um and like i said it's been tough to conclude the budgets although they are quite large in a sense i mean it's one um uh one billion norwegian uh kroner 
over six years, uh, but at the same time, it's far from covering all the applications. If I remember correctly, I think applications were over 3 billion. So uh, obviously we're not able to fund everything. So, um, but uh, we are in about, we are about to finalize these days, actually tomorrow we will do some last things and we will have the director of Nora look at the, our proposed uh, conclusion in the early next week. And we do plan to, um, to announce it mid week next week. So it's not uh, too far away. So I think that's uh, what I have to say about New Red 2. I think uh, we look very much forward to it. Uh, it's been a changes that we think is for the better uh, in order to achieve the main goal, which is to increase uh, capacity within higher education and research in developing countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we just have to say that we believe that the concept of uh, the NUR head is actually what gives the partnership and particularly the partners, the Southern partners, the power to choose what strategically is right for them and not only be directed by agenda coming from the north so uh, we are at the end uh, i would like to say thank you to all speakers for sharing and contributing to a fascinating webinar thank you to our audience for following us today and a special thanks to the center for global health team making this a successful event. If you miss some of today's discussion, please visit our website for the recording that will be published next week. Please stay tuned for future events and we look forward to welcoming you back next time. I wish you all a blessed advent. Thank you very much.